Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests here at Telecom Exchange New York City and for our viewers joining us on RCR TV and JSA TV. Thank you for coming. Today, this is our fourth panel called Taking Stock, today's subsea cable space. We are very honored to have as our moderator, Ms. Elaine Stafford, the managing partner of DRG Undersea Cable Consulting. Elaine has been involved in the development, planning, engineering, and implementation of undersea cable system projects worldwide since the early 80s. With her unique perspective at advising clients across the globe during each stage of undersea cable project lifestyle, life cycle, she's a perfect moderator for this subsea panel. Please welcome my friend, <coughs> Elaine. I didn't realize I was going to follow the session on telemedicine. So for those of you who are young enough to see my bumps and my bruises, I want to say you should see the other gal. All right. Um, actually, these bumps and bruises are relevant to today's discussion. Last week, I was in Spain on the north coast near Bilbao, watching the cable landing of Morea one of the newest transatlantic cables owned by some of the biggest OTTs in the, biggest, in, in, the, in the world. And this is one of the trends that we're going to talk about today is how the OTTs are changing the face of the undersea cable business. Um, I should have not been looking at the cable ship and watching where I was walking and I learned a new word, face plant. You can find it on Wikipedia. Now I've got to put my glasses on. Anyhow, um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, JSA assembled an extraordinarily talented group of gentlemen, CEOs, and executives today that are in the undersea cable space. And I'm really, really pleased to be up here speaking with them and having them speak with each other and speak with you. <laughs> They each come from a different perspective in the industry, which should make the conversation especially interesting. I'd like to start first by introducing what I think of as the newest member of our community, Chris McKee, who's the general counsel and EVP of corporate development at GTT. As many of you know, GTT is a thriving cloud services provider who recently acquired Hibernia, which means they bought three cables. Two of them are relatively, uh, dare I say, aged. They're not old, but they're older than the newest one, Hibernia Express, which gives them um, a really good um, capability to offer diverse services and protected services, something we keep hearing coming up at all of these panels today. Um, GTT's reasons for buying Hibernia as infrastructure to their services will provide us a very uni unique perspective, I think, today as we have our discussion. Next, we have Eduardo Falzoni, CEO of GlobeNet, who offers services largely built on GlobeNet's vast undersea Atlantic backbone, which is also about 15 years old. Thus, for GlobeNet, the undersea cable business is the underpinning of your international services, right? Yes. Um, largely in the Latin America region. Then we have Mike Cunningham, who's been a cornerstone of several undersea initiatives, the most recent of which include Ireland, France, where he serves as chairman, and now also Cross Lake Fiber, a new cable plan from Canada to the US, where Mike is CEO. Mike's in the business of launching new businesses built on niche undersea cable opportunities. Last but not least, is my old friend Matt Ma, executive of network engineering at Tata Communications, the Indian incumbent operator, used to be known as VSNL, who bought the Tata Global Network, or what was then the Tyco Global Network, from Tycom several years ago as a complement to their already existing international backbone. TGN has served Tata well as an enabler to their growing wholesale market as well as expanding its global service opportunities. So you can see we have somebody from each of the different elements of the business. And that's, I think, a little bit of what we'll be talking about today. 
as well as what's changing in the market. One of the questions is, is the cable the business? Or is the cable the infrastructure supporting the business? So today we're going to talk about new trends in the markets, OTT involvement, as I said, drivers of today's resurgence in new cable builds, um, the impact of data centers, diversity and latency on the new build, builds, the evolution of project financing as these cables are seen more and more like infrastructure, how capacity pricing on these cables may evolve as cables fill up, but the ability of technology improvements to expand the capacity is not keeping up in quite, at quite the same pace. How will older cables, those built in the boom around 2000, who are soon reaching their contractual lifetimes, continue to serve the international market, as many think they'll live beyond 25 years and serve a useful purpose? We could talk for hours about each of these items, but we just have I guess, 40 minutes. So I'm here to ask some good questions, there to provide the answers, and so let's start. And I think I'd like to start with our newest member, Chris, if I can. Tell us about your decision as GTT to buy Hibernia and what motivated that and how it's changing your business, please. Sure, uh, so you know, first thing to understand about GTT is that we've grown primarily through acquisition. I joined in, in 2008, we were $60 million in revenue. So over the course of doing you know, a number of, of, of M&A transactions and growing through, going th growing through that, we're now sort of closing in on about a, bill a billion dollars in revenue and we hope to get there by the end of this year. So with every single acquisition we do, and specifically you know, with Hibernia, we look at it, your, your, your initial question was, you know, is the cable the business or is the cable a means to, to serve the business? For, our, for us, the customers are the business, right? There's a, a target customer that we want to serve, which is the largest multinational enterprises in the world now included in the largest multinational enterprises in the world are all of the large OTTs and of course the, you know, the, the financial vertical that we, that we do focus in. And so you know, when we looked at Hibernia, we said, here is an asset serving a group of customers that's right in our sweet spot. We certainly, you know, we provide data connectivity to all of those customers all throughout the world. We have one of the, the five largest internet backbones in the world, but the Hibernia Express under C, under C system, which was the fastest uh, latency path between London and New York was of particular interest, particularly in the financial community because of the latency characteristics. But then, as you said, with the, with the mega OTTs and how they are uh, uh, driving so much of the demand. So what we saw was just sort of another hook and another way to provide more business, have more wallet share of the customers that we covet and target. And so for every single, every single uh, customer that Hibernia brought to us was already a customer of GTT, but but through you know, adding the, sub, the submarine cable assets, we were obviously able to expand and, and deepen our relationship with those customers. Eduardo, do you want to talk about it from a different perspective as you built the cable into a business? Maybe comment on what you needed to do to build it more broadly into a business. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I still think that infrastructure is still a business. Of course, the services you mount on your infrastructure, provide more businesses and to reach your customers. That's absolutely true. But still, there's still uh, room for infrastructure to be a business. Um, of course, and here I have a complaint. Why do we talk about old cables? I'm sorry. <laughs> They're not as old as I am. <laughs> Does that make it better? Yes. Good, good. So, um, for those of us who have been long enough in this industry, we've seen these uh, old cables being deployed in the year 2000. Uh, they're still running, and they'll still have mostly 10 years of, of lifespan. That had, can be increased as well. You can get more lifetime out of a cable system. It has not had too many cuts, of course. The technology is bringing more capacity to the same fiber. So um, infrastructure is still there. It, mostly it is amortized, so it's a good competitive advantage. And we're going to talk about competition afterwards. It's a good competitive advantage to position the old cable systems in a good uh, position to compete with the new cable systems. Because, as I said, the infrastructure still is a business. It's not the same business that it was 15 years ago, but still it is mainly because of the uh, OTTs and the major carriers demanding more and more capacity 
is not any more capacity, it's spectrum or even fiber. So uh, uh, from our perspective, there's still business in the infrastructure. I, I think that's a good lead in for you, isn't it, Mike? I yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with that in terms of, and I hope I agree with it, because we're very focused on primarily single cables and single routes. And we're very asset focused. So our goal is really when serving the wholesale market to become a segment within someone else's network to keep ourselves very resource light focused on simply generating our acceptable rate of return on that specific investment. We're not looking to, to really expand and become all things to all people. And so when, when we look at deploying capital into those specific opportunities, it's very much focused on that cable and, and not really anything beyond it. The opportunities that exist to a large extent are opportunities for our customers to exploit as, as opposed to us. Matt, I want to give you a turn, but I'd like to change the subject if I can. I know all of you could talk about all of this stuff. But I started off talking about OTTs. And as a lot of us look at the market now, especially with new cables, we see the demands of Microsoft, Facebook, Google, soon Amazon, others really driving not only the new builds for cables, but a lot of the capacity demand as well. And we see that as it relates to new cables, they're wanting to build so that they can own their own fiber pairs, because there aren't a lot of fiber pairs left for sale on the major routes. Um, you own TGN. You own a global network around the, around the world that touches, I don't know how many countries. Um, how has your business changed both from the wholesale perspective and from how you look at the evolution of your network with the big influence of the OTTs lately? The changes are actually, uh, it's definitely multifold. So uh, I'll just, so for Tata, we are a whole, full service uh, um, telecom provider. Um, so we have, um, network connectivities as a service from layer zero to layer three. We also have uh, uh, voice services. We have also have UC services. The reason I say that is this is our business model. So from a cable point of view, cable is a business, but also is a platform for the upper layers. Um, when, when OTT come in, um, it definitely poses a challenge because they are extremely savvy on negotiating prices. So they always wanted cost plus model for everything, right? So um, that's a challenge. And uh, whenever they come in, uh, they come in and they usually significantly reduce the market price, causing a pricing erosion. Um, but for us, this this is this is an opportunity as well. Uh, in, in two ways. One is uh, they don't build everywhere, right? If, if you look at uh, what they're doing today, uh, they're, they're mostly building in the more common where the telecom policies are more open, like uh, Transatlantic or Trans-Pacific or maybe in some of the intra-Asia countries. But uh, they do have challenges when it comes to less open uh, countries, Gulf countries, uh, Middle East, Africa, uh, India, those countries. And this is our strength for Tata Communications. So um, w they have the capital, so we take advantage of the, what they have, and they, uh, it's, it's a business relationship, but also it's a partnership relationship because uh, uh, their capital is funding our build of some of the networks as well. So for us, um, this is a, this is an important aspect of uh, um, of that, and particularly um, in, in some of the cable build. When they build the cables, they also need uh, uh, diversities as well, right? I mean, even if they build cable like in Maria or in some of the other initiatives, uh, chances are they need at least three routes in those regions. Whenever the region they go, they identified those are the regions that they expected to have high growth. So, and then they're also looking for diversity. When it comes to diversity, we have also some of the assets in those regions. So that also gives us an opportunity to work with them to leverage what they're building, leverage what we have, uh, to have a more 
um, more diverse network in the end in our hands to serve enterprise needs. So the challenge is definitely there. They really force us to look at our cost very, very hard. But the opportunity of the fact that they have so much capital in their hands also helps, in my mind at least, us to enhance our network and then provide opportunities to serve uh, segments outside of the OTT players, large enterprises and things like that. Eduardo, can we circle back to you and maybe you can comment on that, given some of the new builds in your backyard? Yes, yes, uh, it's absolutely true what uh, Matt said. The OTTs work as an enabler, I would say, of, of the deployment of, of new uh, cables. Um, at the same time, they carry so much traffic and I would say 70, 80% of the traffic that moves around the world it's, uh, is driven by OTTs. So the risk is that they suck so much traffic that there's little left for the rest of the, of the cargoes, right? But that will change because uh, it's, it's like we need some more time until the rest of the, the second tier of OTTs or medium companies or large size enterprises pick up uh, in the need of their capacity and the, the cloud players as well. So that will change and there will be uh, demand as well for uh, the rest of, the, of our customers, our wholesale customers, to cover the rest of the capacity that it's uh, left out of the OTT world. Um, we've seen in, in, in the Americas region, north-south uh, routes, we've seen all of the OTTs uh, playing uh, this, uh, this game. Uh, there are two cable systems ready for service are coming up ready for service in the next uh, three four months. Uh, the OTTs are present in in one of them or two, and it's another cable next year with the presence of the other two OTTs. So they have played the role of the enablers of new infrastructure being deployed in the in the region. At the same time, as as Matt said, <clears throat> there's a need for diversity. Uh, most of these cables are linear cables. They just go from one point to the other point and mainly covering the major cities. Uh, side common uh, that there are many cities that will be left unattended or underserved at the same time. That's where the uh, legacy cables... Better terminology. <laughs> not the old cables, uh, play a role also. Uh, and also play a role in the diversity because, as I said, these linear cables uh, provide one route, but the OTTs uh, require at least uh, three routes into the same city to, uh, to be safe about the, uh, their services. Chris, do you want to comment at all about diversity? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, and the other point I wanted to pick up on that Eduardo said is, is sort of the second group of OTTs, right? I mean, so, you know, what, what we get, you know, as a, as a large IP transit provider, what we see is, you know, our largest IP transit customers are the next, you know, big OTTs, right? I mean, they're, they're somewhere down the path to eventually needing their own data centers and their own, their own uh, capacity demands. I mean, it's a fantastic trend for everybody on this panel and everybody in the room who is trying to sort of address the need, not just of the, of the four OTTs, you know, who, who drive, you know, the, the, the majority of the traffic we've seen so far, but the next five to ten years of it. It's, uh, you know, it's astounding. I mean, carriers, you know, which was sort of, Sub, if we, you know, we were up here 10 years ago, we're talking all about carrier demand for, for subsea cable space. You know, that's a relatively small percentage. I mean, we're, we're a big user. Um, we're actually, this week became a, a large customer of GlobeNet. We purchased Perseus, which, uh, you know, which, which, which is a sort of significant customer now. But carriers, you know, in general are a small piece of it. What we're really seeing is, you know, the, the OTTs that exist now and the ones that are coming in Demand, de, you know, never, never ending demand for it, and that also creates, as as you said, you know, they need two or three paths of diversity to whatever data center they're filling. A lot of this is data center driven demand, so you know that all leads to builds that haven't, you know, even been been put in the planning stages yet. You know, in in, in the the you know, in, in some of the routes probably, you know, like like the transatlantic, you know, there's probably uh, a decent amount of of builds either completed or underway to address it. But, you know, in general, you know, the, the, these mesh networks, I mean, they want three to six options to, to sort of appropriately operate. And when you look around the world and you look at where these OTTs need to be, where the users are, where the data centers are going to be, we're, we're still in early innings in terms of de deployment of subsea cables. 
Okay, so I want to switch back to Matt. I know several of you touch the markets in Asia, but most of you are centered elsewhere. But Matt, you have a lot of business, I think, in Asia. Um, since we're on OTTs, do you care to speculate? I, we didn't discuss this ahead of time, so forgive me for putting you on the spot. When do you think some of the Chinese OTTs will come out from behind PCCW and China Telecom and China Mobile and do the same kinds of things that Facebook and Google and Microsoft are doing in our world? So, so, um, we, so we definitely uh, deal with um, some of the uh, Chinese uh, OTTs like Alibaba, Baidu, or Tencent. Um, today, clearly, they're, they're, I would say, a few years behind uh, where uh, Google or Facebooks of the world um, today they are mostly buying 10 Gs or 100 Gs uh, capacity, um, and uh, their their architectures are relatively um, um, simple, um, and and they deal a lot with the CTG, CU, CMI of the world. Sorry. Uh, China Telecom, China Unicom, and uh, China Mobile of the world. So they're, they're, um, they're, they're still kind of in the infancy of uh, sitting in China, who has a, a 1.3 billion population. Internet is very popular. A um, lot of popular uh, apps, or WeChat is one of them, you know, virtual wallets and all that stuff. They, they're sitting on a gold mine. Uh, they want to not only connecting the Chinese out to the international world, they also want to move some of their apps to the, to the new world. Um, so the needs is definitely there. You see their growth is amazing from where they were, you know, looking for 10 Gs or less just a couple of years earlier now to talking about multiple 100 Gs. Few, not a lot of 100 Gs, but a few hundred Gs in you know, some of the popular routes. So the growth is tremendous, but they're in a relatively um, kind of early, very early stage, and they haven't really used to deal with the international ca carriers or internet. So they haven't really get to the stage of buying internationally. And then so as far as building internationally, that I think is probably another step further down the road. So they're relatively five years. How long? Um, the the with the rate they're going, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, uh, five years, or maybe slightly less than that. Really? The the CT CMI and the CU of the world already participate in some of the consortium cables, right. not only intra Asia but in some of the other parts of the world. Yeah. Right. Uh, so and and maybe initially they were behind, be behind them. But I, I'm not surprised, given the kind of uh, capital they have, I wouldn't be surprised that they will come out to the forefront of the full members of the, the original builders, the original investors, um, less than five years from now. Interesting. I'd like to throw a question out on the table for all of you. Latency and high frequency trader, trading and that business, and I know some of you have unique experience with that. Anybody care to start the conversation? I mean, I'll, I'll start just because, you know, Express is, is obviously one of the features of it is, is the, the fastest route between London and New York. And so, you know, as we look across sort of the spectrum of, of customers we have, I think all customers care about latency. Some customers depend on latency. And some customers, latency is the only thing, and that's the high-frequency trader. So it's a, you know, it's a relatively small group that will only buy the fastest and um, you know, we, and, and there's a premium, you know, associated with that. Um, you know, it's it's a it, it's a relatively small group of people who base their business plans on that. But you know, I would say where where they need that connectivity is expanding. I mean, obviously, we, we, we participate in the the New York to London piece. But what you're seeing is sort of a globalization of you know of, of that demand. I mean, the, the particularly on the foreign exchange traders. Um, so you know, I think one of the underserved markets. Beyond the OTTs um, is is you know faster routes connecting trading centers where where the, the high frequency traders will pay a premium 
for faster routes to the trading centers of the world. So <clears throat> um, a lot of us are under the impression that the um, premiums, as you call them, which are juicy premiums uh, for the high frequency traders and really facilitated the financing of Hibernia Express, which preceded your tenure with them, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, for a long time, I've kind of wondered, is this really going to spread across the globe? Most things that make people money do spread across the globe, right? So you see discussion about the lowest latency path from this point in Asia to the U.S., from this point in South America to the U.S. Do you think that this will spawn new cables in and of itself or just be an, an add-on to a reason for another diverse route driven by a lot of other things? Yeah, so I mean, you know, Express specifically, I mean, remember there still was an OTT anchor that, you know, at, at the center of it. So I, I think, you know, what we've talked about before is the importance of OTTs and the massive amount of, of fiber pairs that they'll speak for, you know, before, before you know, constructions even, even green-lighted, that that will still be a big piece. Where I think the HFTs play, if you can develop a faster route to a trading center, there's additional highly accretive economics that you can add to your, to your business planning. And, you know, there's capacity demands everywhere, and you can make that work, but there's an additional business plan, and it's probably worth the extra investment if you can get faster to a place that the traders want to be. Any of you care to comment on that? Yeah, I, I just add my two cents here. The... The latency aspect, uh, in terms of being the lowest latency, is is definitely an additional profit center. But at least from my perspective, even on routes where we have a latency advantage, it's never enough to justify uh, building the cable on its own. You, we, you have to have the other economics of it being a desirable route in order to do that. And maybe the latency gets you over the finish line or just makes it more profitable. But in and of itself, it it's never, in my experience, been a large enough market from a dollar perspective to justify that capex. So, Mike, um, you've had to work at financing a number of new projects. And when we as DRG look at, at new projects that people ask us to help develop business plans for now, we've kind of concluded that you have to sell a number of the fiber pairs on a cable to anchor tenants to get through the point where you're going to find that business plan for the cable to be attractive enough to get financing. Do you care to comment on that and how you see that in today's world? The OTTs are the anchors in some of the newer cables? Uh, I, I think it depends on the route. For your long-haul transoceanic routes, I think that's absolutely the case. When you have cables that are several hundred million dollars, to have an OTT that is a uh, internal use customer, so they're not competing with you in the market, but they take off a, a large amount of that capex and to the extent that you can have a lot more OTTs or multiple OTTs taking uh, a high percentage of the capex of that project, um, that, that definitely makes the economics a lot easier w when you're selling the remainder of the capacity on that cable. But there are other instances where, as an example, we've financed a cable that had no OTT involvement and even no um, spectrum or fiber pair sales. Our model in, in one specific example was purely long-term leases. So I think for you, you can't wholly classify it as needing OTTs as either a driver or even having to sell fiber pairs or spectrum in order to, to justify uh, that investment. Anybody else care to comment? Yeah, I want to make a comment on the uh, low latency. Yeah. Um, we carry the uh, lowest latency network between North and South America and actually between New York and Sao Paulo. And uh, I have to confirm both uh, opinions of, of Chris and, and Mike that you cannot justify the lane of a new cable with the low frequency uh, trading business. It's a niche, it's a small business. There's no way you can justify the lane of a cable. If you have it, it's an advantage, yes, because there's a premium that is being paid for that, uh, for that route. Uh, but in no way can justify uh, a new cable. Um, also, there are uh, connecting cities that, ha that have these, um, uh, uh, these uh, exchanges. There are not many exchanges city with exchanges in the world, right? New York, London is probably the, the largest route for this type of uh, high-frequency trading. But uh, for instance, Sao Paulo, uh, we carry the traffic between Sao Paulo and Bovespa and New York Exchange. And uh, it's, it's 
tiny orders of magnitude of what the London New York route is. Um, but I want to drop something for for the next uh, conversations. Low latency is not only important. High frequency is the ones who pay the most premium for for that route. But the gaming industry is also very um, keen on the latency as well. Just drop it for next uh, next panel, maybe. Anybody want to pick up on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think all customers care about latency. There's there's a, a, a small segment that you know pays a super premium for you know one nanosecond, but you know I, I think uh, in cable design and cable performance, I mean latency is important. I mean you know it is, is, as you know. Gaming depends on on a little bit of lag, uh, on, on less lag, and and you know a lot of the OTTs are you know these are highly dense you know sort of vi you know video cache type type products. So latency, you know, we have more and more customer con contracts that deal with latency more than price. Uh, the, the latency SLAs are are probably debated and talked about more than the price points. It's interesting. I'd like to. Go to price now a little bit, and nobody's going to quote numbers. But Matt, you talked a little bit about price before with the pressures from the OTTs and cost plus, and the like. Um, I'm wondering what you think about the pricing trends moving forward. As I think somebody said, um, the capacity of a fiber pair is not growing quite at the rate because of technology evolution that it used to. When systems were put in with two and a half gigabits in the <clears throat> legacy time frame. Um, they are now carrying 100 gigabit channels or more. Um, I don't think anybody thinks that those systems that are going in now with 100 gigabit or more channels are going to multiply by that factor of whatever it was, 40. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about whether pricing of capacity in the market, which eroded maybe on the order of 20 odd percent or 20 percent over the past many years, was actually enabled not only because the networks were depreciated, but also because the cost of upgrading the networks was coming down relatively rapidly because of the technology and the underlying capacity expansion capability of the networks. With that changing, that under, if, that, if that really helped fuel the capability of operators to reduce their capacity prices, what's going to happen to capacity prices moving forward? Well, we, I guess we can draw some uh, conclusions of trying to predict uh, the future based on the past performance. Um, they're good things and they're bad things, right? Uh, if you look at uh, what happened, for example, in the uh, transatlantic market, um, they were, so before the 100G, uh, it was 10G, was the most popular product uh, from a connectivity point of view. And um, the pricing erosion back then was uh, eroding probably 20, 20 percent or 20 plus percent year over year, and to the point that um, that it, it's just it's only barely supported by the capex you put in for upgrade those 10 Gs, and then for those couple of years actually pricing temporarily stabled a little bit. I mean it, it's not that it didn't decline, but it declined much much slower uh, comparing to the uh, previous years, and then 100 G coming. And the technology coming, and uh, it it uh, provided much better cost, uh, uh, unit cost uh, upgrade. Uh, therefore, the uh, the pricing decline resumed. So today we're in the middle of probably uh, the uh, 100G deployment, where you still have a a, a reasonable uh, pricing unit cost reduction. Uh, benefit year over year from just the technology uh, evolution. Um, but so you still see a, like Elaine said, probably a 20% or so uh, pricing erosion in the marketplace. Now, hopefully, as, as the, um, as the uh, pricing up, uh, getting, uh, you know, cl approaching to the, uh, the upgrade, cost uh, bottom line, hopefully people will behave rationally. So that's a hope that there will become uh, um, uh, the, the pricing erosion will, will slow down. Now, there's the, the two big uncertainties, right? One is, can we all behave rationally? 
um, there, there's still, nevertheless, you know, a lot of uh, competitors and people build, invest for different reasons, and therefore they sell their access capacity for different reasons. So can we behave rationally? That's one question. Uh, hopefully, uh, with the past history, uh, hopefully we will. The second thing is, uh, also Elaine alluded to, is uh, the technology. Uh, technology, we are probably halfway to the Shannon limit, right? So um, how, how close do you, can we be to the Shannon limit? Mm, 80% close? Um, I don't think that's something that 80% uh, uh, is something that, that we can see right now. But maybe in a few years we will. So that just means that um, the, the, we, the, the technology benefit uh, of year-over-year -year cost reduction uh, also is going to slow down. So these factors is going to you know, pose us a, a great question of can we behave rationally? Can we really, you know, based on what is out there from technology, um, so hopefully market will uh, stabilize somewhat uh, in the next uh, maybe uh, three years, three to five years. Those of you in the Atlantic where you've got new competition coming in, how do you see market behavior? I mean, there's, there's some interesting dynamics going on, right? I mean, you have uh, new, new competition, new, new builds coming in, but supported by demand. But as you refer to them as, we're referring to legacy cables now. I mean, we're, we operate two legacy cables. I mean, we all know, you know, in this room, there's a, there's a certain amount of fixed costs that aren't being, being impacted to, you know, run your ships and do the upkeep of those cables. Uh, there, there are no sort of big pricing declines there. And so I think, you know, the, you know as, as we talked about, the cables don't have that much electronics in them. They, they have electronic life well beyond when they'd be retired. They'd be retired because the fixed cost of running those cables at some point, you know, with the pricing, the, the pricing erosion just doesn't make any sense. What happens in the Atlantic when some of those legacy cables get retired? Now you have, you know, you know in, in a scenario where we've had in the last couple of years, we've had some cables added, some more coming. Now if you start to see some of those cables retired, as you know, it's all, all, in, a, all in a scenario where, you know, uh, more and more bit demand exists, more and more raw bit demand exists. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, would you see pricing go up? Would you see the, the decline, you know, the decline knee out? I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think, you know, as pricing erodes, the, the, you'll, the, the natural impact in the Atlantic is you'll see some of those legacy cables retired. Eduardo? Yes. <clears throat> um, I think that also that there should be a point in which the price erosion should stop. Of course, competition coming in the next uh, year or two will drive prices down for a little while. But in the long term, there's no way that the, uh, the current rate of uh, price erosion can keep up um, because the technology, as Matt was explaining, is, is, is not going to go that far as 20, 30 percent per year. Uh, the only um, thing that we can hope that the revenue at, at least stabilizes our growth uh, a, a little bit. Uh, probably we will end up like the uh, consumer, the, uh, the mobile plans that we have today, in which we are given the same, we pay the same amount of money every year, we get more gigabits uh, per month, the price per gigabit or per, per megabit decreases, but we end up paying the same amount of money at the end of the month. Uh, probably we'll reach that point in the next uh, three, five years, in which we hope that we can keep the revenue uh, growing, uh, but for that we need to increase the capacity that the cables uh, will be able to deliver. So Mike, as you finance your projects, you need to look at the demand and the growth rates compared to the price declines that you forecast. How do you see all this? Yeah, I, I, I believe that for all intents and purposes, the projects that are in development today or will be put into service in the near term are going to be subject to price deflation in almost all large markets for, for most of their life. And I think the only thing that can potentially mitigate that to some extent is the fact that there's a lot more theoretical capacity in the market than is actually being sold in the market, and that's driven by the OTTs. The OTTs who are acquiring fiber pairs today aren't putting that capacity into the market. So let's say they own 50% of a new cable that has 100 terabits capacity. There'll be 50 terabits, half of that, that sit dark until 20 years when the OTTs actually begin to, to grow 
into that capacity. I also think that, um, especially in the Atlantic market right now, the structure of those cables, are, they're more wholesale cables. It's, it's going to lead to price deflation until they're out of service, which on and on you can show that you can continue to make the economic case not to take them out of service. And I also think that uh, the introduction of C plus L band um, really helps increase the, um, the potential capacity of new cables to a point where you're doubling on a per fiber pair basis the amount of capacity you can get through that cable. So I still see a lot of uh, very large thematic um, reasons why price deflation is going to continue for, for the purposes of considering the return on a, a current investment. So do any of you with legacy networks, either in part or in whole, um, care to comment on future-proofing your infrastructure? I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's a, as I said, you know, it's, it, you're constantly doing the economics of it. I mean, you, know, you don't think of it as a price per bit necessarily. You think about what is this cable system returning in terms of revenue and profit, right? You know, I, I actually like the analogy to, to the phones. It's like, you know, I'm getting $110 from my phone subscriber. I'm, I'm getting $110 from them, right? You know, technology improvements and, you know, sort of sm smoother operations. You know, we have, we have three cables, and we look at each one, and what are they returning in terms of revenue and profit? And you'll sort of continue to spin the dials on, do you have to, to, to do technology improvements to put more bits over the wires? Do you have, what, what do you have to do on pricing? And, you know, and, and, and maybe not, but, you know, uh, you know, does it actually make economic sense to retire one of the three cables and... You know, have a you know have push your demand over the other over the other two. Uh, I'd say all all are in play uh, in, in the Atlantic, which is a more mature market uh, than than some of the others that we're looking at. There's there's still I think you know I want to point out that you know throughout the world what we see are largely underserved markets. You know even for the OTTs, I mean they just where where their where their big end users are is largely still underserved. Yeah, I would say um, we, we we're doing a pretty good job um, as a as, uh, well, speaking for maybe just for Tyler, but I think it's uh, applicable for others as well. We have a fairly large um, network. We have a spectrum of networks, but a lot of asset uh, was built in 2001, 2002. And I think we've been working with uh, some of the industrial leaders, um, the SLT suppliers, and making sure that uh, the product they roll out uh, uh, is uh, equally applicable uh, to to, to the le legacy networks. Uh, uh, and I can, uh, there are a lot of things you, you work with them to make sure that it's a technology issue. It's also uh, the pricing issue. Um, we work with them very, very closely so, um, uh, so, so that to make sure the legacy, um, the, the cables uh, can be used um, to support, and so far, I think uh, um, I would say that uh, there's really not there's nothing that is unique to the newer cables. Um, that meaning that only the, there's something that only the newer cables can support, the legacy cables cannot support. Uh, and the way the technology is evolving, instead of jumping from, for example, one of the old thing in old days, the difference between the old cable and the new cable is. The new cables can support, say, 10G. The old cables can only support 2.5G. That's a significant differentiator. But today, if you look at how the technology is rolled out, uh, the, 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 band, the line side of the bandwidth is much more liquid. In other words, it's no longer is can the new cable roll out 400 Gs or one terabit channel uh, data rate anymore. That's not. That, that's not a question anymore. The question becomes, okay, uh, if the line rate can be increased at 50 gigahertz increment, right? So what is the maximum you can put on to get the most efficient? So from a technology point of view, the legacy cables are no longer put, uh, is not at least in a disadvantage of something the newer cables can do, the, the, the legacy cables cannot do anymore. And I think it's also safe to say that we do know of at least one major cable that formally decided, based on some evidence, that their cable was going to last longer than the 25-year design life as well. So yeah. that may be the first of a trend. Um, 
We're going to run out of time soon, so I wanted to open it up for questions from the audience. Back there. Uh, as uh, satellite technology improves and launch vehicle technology improves, um, and people build uh, optical communications as a service uh, with satellites, do you, any of you envision I, I, that as either a threat, an opportunity, or not even under radar? I, mean, I, can, I can jump in. You know, so for the specific route that we that we operate, London to New York, uh, you know, not not a threat at this time. I mean, I mean, you know, I think where you see wireless and RF, you know, obviously making a difference is in the in the HFT market, in the low latency market, and specifically over land routes. You know, I think you know if you look at the dynamics and what happened in Chicago to New York with you know a wireline route then being made faster via RF. Um, tough to do across the Atlantic, tough to do across the Pacific. And so, you know, I don't think it's a, a threat to, to what we do now. I think, but I think, and, and, and I don't actually think that impacts too much of what's going on with OTT demand, because, I mean, what, what wireless and satellites allow you to do is to, is to speed things up to lower the latency, which are very, very severely limited in what you can do capacity-wise. The one thing that these OTTs want is massive amounts of capacity. And so I think, you know, that's, that's another limitation uh, that, that makes the, you know, if you're if if you're basing your business on 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 HFTs and low latency between two cities, I think that wireless has to be considered a threat. But I'm not sure it is on the OTT business side. Mike is dying to say something. <laughs> I, I mean, historically, it's never been able to supplant fiber. At the same time, there there is a ton of capital and a, a, a many different companies with very credible backers putting money into the satellite space, and maybe not on some of your your core, large, primary transatlantic routes, but on some of those other uh, periphery routes or um, uh, more rural or remote areas, uh, I, I'm definitely uh, listening uh, and, and eager to find out where, uh, where the market goes, um, just because it is potentially uh, a competitive threat in some instances. But we'll, we'll have to see whether that's proven out or not. Eduardo, are you grabbing the mic? No, no, no. Just to say that, uh, yeah, we agree. It's, it's not a threat. And uh, regarding the demands of not only the OTT but the rest of the players, is based basically on the capacity and latency. And so they cannot provide both uh, in a competitive way compared with the fiber. Okay, I've been told we're out of time, so I want to thank you all, Chris, Eduardo, Mike, and Matt. It was an excellent panel. Thank you very much.